Let's get started. Hi, my name is Chuck Gilbert. Good evening. I'm on the board of Alaska Common Ground. I want to welcome you to tonight's legislative update. It's um, budget negotiations and a fiscal plan, kind of with a question mark at the end. Alaska Common Ground was founded in 1991 with the purpose of collecting and disseminating information on Alaska public issues and problems, facilitating discussion of them, seeking consensus on them, and developing solutions and encouraging their adoption and implementation. As you all know, after more than 30 years, Alaska has yet to solve its fiscal problems and achieve a sustainable fiscal plan. Tonight's session is the latest in a long string of public events on the state's fiscal issues that Alaska Common Ground has hosted in the past 30 years. We greatly appreciate two of our legislative leaders taking time out of their very busy legislative six schedules to give us an update on budget negotiations and progress toward a, a fiscal plan. So we'll start off with presentations from our two legislative leaders, and then we'll open it up to questions from, from anybody attending. If you have a question, please type them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will collect these and present them to the panelists after their presentations are concluded. This event is being recorded in case you or your friends want to watch it later. It will be available on the Alaska Common Ground website and its YouTube, YouTube, you, YouTube channel. In the event, the event will run until 7 p.m., but we can extend for a little time if there's more questions to be answered. Alaska Common Ground could not conduct the work we do without the support from our members and donors. If you would like to support events like this one, please consider becoming a Common Ground member or donating uh, online at alaskacommonground.org. Now we'd like to introduce our moderator, Drew Kaysen, who will introduce our panelists and moderate the questions and answer session. Drew is a third generation Alaskan who grew up in Anchorage and graduated from West High School and UAA. Drew has worked on public policy in Washington, DC, Juneau, Anchorage, and is a legislative staffer and lobbyist. Drew is also a former Alaska Common Ground board member. Drew currently serves as the Workforce Development Program Manager at Anchorage Economic Development Corporation. So with that, Drew, our moderator, please take it away. Well, uh, thank you for convening us and uh, welcome, Chuck, uh, and for all the work you did to pull this event together. I am certainly looking forward uh, from hearing from our esteemed panelists. Um, First up, we've got Senator Kathy Giesel. Uh, Senator Giesel was born and raised in Fairbanks, territory of Alaska. Senator Giesel worked as an RN for 49 years and is as an advanced nurse practitioner for 23. She served in the state Senate from 2011 through 2020, including as Senate president in 2019 and 2020. Senator Giesel rejoined the legislature in 2023 and currently serves as the majority leader of the Senate bipartisan coalition. Thanks for joining us, Kathy. Uh, and I will uh, I'll do both introductions and then pitch it over uh, to Senator Giesel to uh, give the first presentation. So uh, our other panelist is Representative Calvin Shragi. Uh, Representative Shragi is a third generation Alaskan born and raised in Anchorage. Uh, he graduated from UAA in 2015 with a degree in accounting and currently leads Frontier Tutoring as executive director. Before being elected to the State House in 2020, Representative Shragi served on the Abbott Loop, Loop Community Council and on the board of the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce. Representative Shragi uh, was re-elected to represent District 12 in the State House last fall and now serves as the minority leader of the Alaska House Coalition. So um, thank you both so much for taking the time. I know this is an incredibly stressful and really busy time of year, so it means a lot that you're uh, out here talking to Alaskans. Um, we've got to balance the budget. Uh, we've been spending more than we've been bringing in for several years, and uh, it's pretty clearly not something that can continue. So uh, where are we at with that? Uh, I'll, I'll just pass it off with that, because I think we all kind of understand why we're here. Well, Drew, thanks for having us. I know Representative Shroggy is also pleased to be here, and, and he'll tell you that in a moment. Um, 
You know, the balanced budget is of interest to all Alaskans. I will tell you also that the Senate majority organized this last fall with three priorities. Number one, increase the base student allocation to adequately fund education. Number two, return to a defined benefit pension system. Recruitment and retention is a huge issue. We believe the defined benefit would make a massive difference. And number three, as you point out, a balanced budget with a solution to the dividend. The dividend itself has been, um, well, it's been the massive rock in the middle of the road that has occupied uh, most of our time. Uh, I think you have all recognized that as time has gone on. So how are we doing for these three goals? Well, we proposed, uh, actually, uh, I will give the credit to Senator Loki Tobin. She is uh, the chairman of the Senate Education Committee. Incredible job. She is just doing great. And she dug into this with her team, which has several ed educators on it. Uh, and she is proposing a $1,000 increase to the base student allocation. The base student allocation, as you may know now, is at this time, is about $5,600 for every student. I mean, I have the exact number here somewhere, but about $5,600. But if you, uh, and it's been flat funded, it's been at that amount for about the last 10 years. Well, we all know that inflation is the thief in the night, as Ed Rasmussen uh, once said, eating up our money. So adjusted for inflation, that BSA should be closer to $6,700. Loki is proposing a $1,000 increase and then moving up, I think it's another 300 million more uh, the following year. Uh, the problem is, of course, always, it's lovely to have this goal, but how do we pay for it? Right now, we're wrestling with that question of how to pay for it. Uh, and there are other pieces here that come into play, but I'll stop there on education. How are we doing on returning to the defined benefit pension system? Well, I know that there hasn't been much news on this, but actually we're progressing very well, thank you. Uh, tomorrow, let's see, today's Tuesday, right. So tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, the Senate Labor and Commerce Committee will roll out a new version of Senate Bill 88. Uh, this, this new version has uh, put much more improvements into the teacher's defined benefit program, addressing those nuances that teachers face in terms of a retirement system, such as what counts as their wages, what is a full compensation, should they re be required to have five consecutive years to establish their high wage, like the PERS, and the answer is no, they require a nuance there. Anyway, we fixed all of that. Labor and Commerce will have this bill before them tomorrow. They're going to hear from opponents. They're also going to hear from advocates who can counter all the points that opponents will make against a defined benefit, uh, defined benefit pension system. We actually believe the bill as it's been crafted now with input from NEA, the firefighters, the police officers, public employees actually will either equal the cost for the defined contribution system we have right now or actually save the state money. So this is gonna be pretty fun to have it roll out tomorrow uh, in labor and commerce, uh, so keep watching. Uh, and then lastly, a balanced budget. So when we talk about a balanced budget, we're talking about the operating budget, right? Um, what's left over from that we have to use for a capital budget, but let's go with the operating budget. The House starts the operating budget and Representative Shroggy is going to give you the lowdown of what they went through to write that operating budget. They send it over to us and the problem that we face is it's $600 million underwater. In other words, there's a funding gap of $600 million. So our finance team has been working hard on that um, and actually has in front of them right now an operating budget that is balanced. They just today uh, read across a, a capital budget that is very constrained. 
Uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't have the exact number here. I should have brought it with me, but it's around $360 million. Uh, basically, it addresses deferred maintenance issues and some matching funds for roads and bridges, the Whittier Tunnel, things like that. There's really nothing for those capital requests that citizens make from every district. I have Whittier and they have a daycare center called Little Bears. Well, it's, it's, it's a very, very old building. It really needs to be renovated. I can't get a capital appropriation for it. I mean, those are the kinds of things we can't fund right now. But part of that balanced budget is getting a solution to the dividend. We have a bill that is out on the street, it's on the table, Senate Bill 107. It, would, um, it, it advocates for a 50-50 dividend, but only after we have um, established a substantial CBR of about $3.6 billion balance in our CBR, uh, and we've brought in $1.3 billion in new annual recurring revenue. You know, Drew, I think a lot of your listeners today um, are folks that follow the budget and will recognize that Alaskans for the past, oh, 40 some years have been relying on what I refer to as OPM. That's OPM, other people's money. And those other people's money is what we get from the permanent fund, right? This money was set aside by the generations before us who didn't spend it all, but put it away in the corpus of the permanent fund for days like today when we don't have as much oil. Uh, the first thing we turn to to fill a budget gap is oil. I'll talk a little bit about some revenue bills that we have uh, in front of the Senate. I want to give Representative Shroggy time to talk about um, what's happening on the House side. So I'm going to save our revenue measures for the next uh, next insertion. Let's let uh, Representative Shroggy speak for a while. Thanks so much, Drew. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Giesel. I, I had not heard the OPM before, uh, but I uh, love it. Um, Representative Shroggy, your turn. Uh, what do you see happening with the uh, fiscal situation? Yeah, th thank you, Drew, and uh, thanks to Alaska Common Ground for the opportunity to be here with you all. I, uh, it feels like just yesterday that it was 2018 and I was starting to pay attention to uh, just that much more to the budget issues we were facing in the state and attended a number of your events. And then as a candidate, as we con continued to see the cuts of 2019 take place, and it's just um, a, a great pleasure to be on with you guys. I, I know we've got a bunch of folks that really care a lot about our state and uh, follow these big issues very closely. And so it's just an absolute pleasure to be on with you all and, and on with uh, the majority leader in the Senate, Senator G uh, Giesel. Um, so how did we get here? Well, you all know that, uh, as as I just indicated through my past, uh, you know, interaction with Alaska Common Ground. But as you all know, oil prices have, have fallen and oil production has continued to fall over the years. Uh, we have undergone significant cuts over the last decade. And now we're really at a place where we continue to see a shortfall of revenue and really a base uh, bare bone level of services that Alaskans really cannot uh, go without at this point. And I think that that is really evidenced by the budget process that we had in the House this year um, and through the governor's recent positions. So as Senator Giesel mentioned, uh, the House passed an operating budget out and it was a budget with a $600 million deficit. Now, that's not something that I'm a fan of as uh, not only a fiscal conservative, but someone that uh, has spent time in private business. You don't typically uh, deficit spend without a plan to stop that hemorrhaging. And that was our major criticism in the budget process as we went through it is we really can't uh, deficit spend. In fact, the governor cannot sign a budget that deficit spends without a funding source. And the reason we ended up in this position is because, as Senator Giesel mentioned, it's very difficult to balance uh, the dividend, state services, uh, with the real shortfall of revenue that we have if we want to continue to protect the permanent fund and not overdraw our, our either the permanent fund or our state savings accounts. And so what we made the case for is a budget that stayed within the constraints of not further spending from our savings because we don't have a plan for how to stop doing so. 
we don't want to overdraw the 5% POMB on the permanent fund so that that continues to grow and be a sustainable source of revenue to the state. And we want to make investments in those things that will best address the issues that are most important to Alaskans. And when I talk about those issues, I talk about state services like public safety and education. I, I'm talking about mental health and, you know, API and our university system. All these things that we know really uh, help provide a quality of life to Alaskans, but also help to grow that next generation of workers and those that um, invest in our state. I I think oftentimes to the wonderful state of this um, state addresses from the judiciary and uh, Justice Winfrey's comments of we're the children of Alaska and we need to continue to invest in that next generation of children in Alaska if we want to grow this state. So that's the case that we made in the budget that we should maintain those spending sideboards of not spending down our savings or spending down the permanent fund beyond what's sustainable and we want to invest in things like education and base bone state services. We could have done that. We could have made new investments in early learning and child welfare and um, expansion of postpartum, all those uh, postpartum care, all those sorts of things, um, if we were willing to bring the dividend down to an amount that's historically average, an amount of around $1,300, $1,400. Unfortunately, we run, that's where we run into one of the major challenges in the state, which is that dividend question, which Senator Giesel spoke to. It continues to be the, the rock in the middle of the path, the stick in the mud that's so hard to get around. And that is where we ultimately saw the deficit created. What we passed out of the house was not the $1,300 or $1,400 dividend, which again, would have been historically average and would have allowed us to have a balanced budget and would have allowed us, now that we're working on a capital budget, to make investments in our infrastructure, in our deferred maintenance, in our crumbling roads, all of those sorts of things. Instead, we chose to pass out a $2,700 dividend, a 50-50 dividend, which created a $600 million deficit. So that budget is now in the Senate, where we are hoping that the Senate will help to correct some of the errors in our ways. Uh, I noted during the press conference today that the Senate and the House, uh, the Senate majority and the House minority are aligned on those sideboards on spending, aligned on the idea that we shouldn't spend down saving, aligned on the idea that we shouldn't overdraw the permanent fund, and that we should make many of those same investments. And of course, we also want to make sure that we leave the room, the, the altitude to be able to pass things like defined benefit and a long-term increase to the BSA so that our schools are well supported. So we're optimistic that the Senate will be able to correct some of those issues or at least better balance that budget than we were able to and then send it back to us for, for passage. Um, but that is still going to leave a structural issue in our state. We continue to see folks that want higher dividends because admittedly the dividends provide a lot of benefit to Alaskan families. Um, I know families in my neighborhood, I hear all the time about families throughout the rest of the state that really benefit from that money. Um, we cannot pay those larger amounts while still making those investments in public safety, education, all those other services I mentioned. And so that's where we really see, I think, a renewed interest in, in developing a fiscal plan. And we've seen interest kind of, you know, ebb and flow, come and go, you know, peaks and valleys uh, over, over the recent years. But I think what is new now is we have our Republican governor, uh, acknowledging a need for new revenue. Whereas in recent years, it was no new revenue without a vote of the people. We now hear discussion coming from the administration of, all right, we there there is a structural issue. We've seen this struggle year after year. And frankly, and I think this is where it's coming from for the governor, other people, especially those outside of our state, those that want to invest in Alaska, see that instability. They see that structural deficit. They see that lack of plan for how we're going to be able to make these investments in our state in a sustainable way. You know, the governor talks about a need for us to have cranes in the skies again. We need to have families moving here, kids being born here. We need to see the state growing and prospering and investment taking place here. And what I know from my accounting degrees at our great old University of Alaska Anchorage uh, is that businesses do not want to invest where there is a heightened level of risk. And one form of risk that we have in the state of Alaska is fiscal instability. 
businesses don't want to invest here and bring their workers here and create jobs here if they don't know how schools are going to be funded in five years. They don't know how we're going to make these investments year after year. And I think the governor has started to hear that message from outside groups that want to invest here, you know, private capital groups that, uh, you know, again, want to invest. And they're saying, we would love to come to Alaska. There is opportunity in Alaska, but only if you can come up with a long-term plan for how you're going to function like every other state functions and be able to, to, to have those checks cash when they go when people go to the bank with them. Um, and so that's where we're really seeing that renewed uh, interest now. I think the challenge, one of the challenges that we now face, despite this kind of, uh, you know, tailwind from the governor, is we've got 20 something days left now in the session. And really, it is very difficult uh, to pass new revenue measures in this short of a time frame, even with the support of the governor. Now, the House minority is ready to take action on many of the components of a fiscal plan, and I'm sure there will be questions on what all of those components are. There's revenue bills in the Senate. We've introduced bills ourselves, um, but there, there's not a lot of time to find consensus on that at this point. Uh, especially when we're not seeing these bills advance out of committee and make it to the floor. And that's particularly an issue in the state house where the ways and means committee has heard over the last three months or so numerous components of the fiscal plan, but not yet moved any of these bills to the floor. And so we really need all, we need the house, we need the Senate, and we need the governor all working together for really going to achieve this. And that's what we're really still waiting to see. So we remain optimistic that we can get something done this session. Session. But if we can't, we still want to continue working towards that so that we can set the stage either for, you know, God forbid, and I say God forbid as someone who lived through, what, five special sessions in 2020. One uh, would really prefer not to see that happen again, but if there is to be a special session, uh, maybe we can lay some of the groundwork for that to be a more productive special session than we've seen in the past, or if not a special session, have laid the groundwork for the next regular session in 2024. So we'll see. We will continue working towards that goal of having a long-term fiscal plan. It's something I believe strongly in. I know it's something that the Senator believes strongly in. Frankly, it's good for Alaska for so many reasons, um, but maybe I uh, just stop here because I know that the Alaska Common Ground audience has some great questions always, and uh, I'd, I'd love to maybe hone in on what those questions are and provide some answers. Thank you, Calvin, um, and Senator Giesel uh, as well. Uh, between the two of you, I think you've sort of laid out the situation really well. And one of the things that I'm hearing and sort of taking away from all this is that the PFD and the budget, there's some disagreement on both of those, but sort of all of the, the pieces are on the board and the table is set. The revenue one, there's, you know, this talk of things in the wings and maybe there's a new bill coming from the administration. So, uh, you know, the Senate, uh, Senator Giesel is where sort of the longest tenured uh, spending bills of this legislature reside and that have made the most progress. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about those? Yeah, thanks, Drew. So the Senate has proposed some annual recurring revenue. So it starts with uh, some oil changes to some oil tax structure. Probably the easiest one to understand and the one that is, I'm gonna call it popular <laughs> because most Alaskans understand that there's a difference between C corporations, this is an IRS designation for a publicly traded corporation and an S corporation. This is a private uh, company that has uh, one or more owners and they are taxed by the IRS, not as a company, but the individual owners are taxed on their personal income tax. So in Alaska, we have mainly C corps that uh, develop our oil. ConocoPhillips, BP was, Exxon is, Santos. These are all C corps. Alaska has adopted the federal government's uh, tax structure. So these companies are taxed. We have a corporate income tax. They pay the 9.4%, which is our top corporate income tax amount. We have one outlier and that's Hill Corp. Hill Corp is a privately owned company. Uh, Jeff Hildebrand is the man that owns uh, Hill Corp. I believe he has some minor partners uh, in the ownership of the company. But regardless, that company does not pay our C Corp, our corporate income tax that the other companies pay. So it's been many years that Hill Corp has been working here and not paying this tax. 
So what's been proposed by the Senate is actually a taxation structure that would target Hill Corp. Any company that makes more than four uh, four million dollars a year would be taxed just like a C corporation at the 9.4 percent tax structure. Uh, that that uh, particular tax, we believe, would bring in approximately 500 million dollars a year. Now that amount could go down over time, depending on the price of oil, depending on production, depending on their profits, those kinds of things but about 500 million, oh, pardon me, pardon me. I was looking at the wrong, the other tax structure. It would bring in about 200 million, pardon me. The S Corp tax would bring in about 200 million as a corporate, as a income tax. The other piece we're proposing is a change in the $8 a barrel deduction that the companies can make on a barrel of oil. We call it a sliding scale. So when the price of a barrel of oil drops below $80 a barrel, companies can drop the taxable value of each barrel by $8. Between $80 and $90 a barrel, they can deduct $7 a barrel from the price of a a value of oil. And up the scale it goes to $150 a barrel when zero, they can deduct nothing from that value of that barrel of oil at $150 a barrel. Why would we do this? Well, when the price of oil is low, we give the companies a little bit of a break, an $8 break per barrel, right? But when the price of a barrel of oil is very high, they get no break, we collect more, they're collecting more too. So this is called uh, the eight to five slider. Um, lots of Alaskans send me emails about this. We believe, believe that this change in our tax structure, moving that $8 down to only $5. So at $80 a barrel, instead of being able to deduct $8, they would only be able to deduct $5. And it would go up from there it would reach zero at a much lower price of oil. I think it's about a hundred and, I think at about $105 a barrel, they get zero deduction on that value. But we believe that particular tax structure change would bring in about $500 million. So with those two things, the S corporation change and the eight to five slider, it would bring in about $700 million. Now, uh, Representative Shroggy and I have pointed out to you that the House's budget has a $600 million uh, gap. So obviously that one bill, this is a bill by Senator Wilikowski, um, it's Senate Bill 114. That bill would fill the gap. Now, it doesn't fill the gap immediately. Drew, you've worked in the legislature. You know that we pass a bill, it has an effective date, but then the regulations have to be written. So it'd be a year before it would become effective. Um, the other tax that, that has been proposed, Senator Wilkowski has proposed it, is called the Digital Business Corporation Income Tax. So that sounds pretty complicated, but actually what it is, is levying a corporate income tax on businesses like Amazon uh, that do business here in Alaska. They make a profit here in Alaska. Maybe they're TV streaming, online advertising, consumer data sales, music, video, software stuff, app purchases. So actually taxing, corporate income taxing those companies. Other states do this as well. That is estimated the first year to bring in about $72 million. So again, these are annual recurring revenues. This is what we are striving to do. Lastly, uh, Representative Shroggy talked about the dividend and the dividend split. This is the, this is the uh, third rail of politics, of course. Don't touch my dividend. I want a full dividend, right? I get a few emails like that still, and I'm sure Representative Shroggy does too. The governor has been asking for a full, air quotes, full statutory dividend that would be significantly high. I don't know what it would be this year. It'd be somewhere around north of $3,000 for every man, woman, and child. He has moved to the place of advocating now for a 50-50 split. That's dividing the percent of market value that comes out of the earnings of the fund and dividing it 50-50. 50% for dividend, 50% for government services. So this coming year 
a 50% dividend would be a $2,700 dividend as Representative Shroggy just referred to. It would, it would cost us um, uh, $1.7 billion, okay? So that's a lot of money, uh, uh, a $2,700 dividend. And uh, what the Senate has on the table is a bill that would divide it 2575, 25% going for a dividend, 75% going to state services. This would be, as Representative Shroggy just said, about a $1,300 dividend for every man, woman, and child who qualifies. And it would leave about $2.6 billion left to invest in state services, like the full $1,000 increase in the BSA for every student. Right now, all we can afford, this is the Senate side, is about $500. That's half of really what the school districts need to fully fund their programs. It would allow us to uh, have more to invest in, in upgrading the, the data system that allows us to get food stamps out in a timely manner. It would allow us to, to get the Medicaid reauthorizations done more quickly. Uh, just many places, public safety investments, uh, many places we could invest that money as well as capital budget, like I think about Little Bears in Girdwood, that daycare center that badly needs a new building. Um, so we, are working with our group. Uh, you know, we have 17 out of the 20 members in our bipartisan coalition. And we are working with everyone to see if we can get to that 2575 split. Um, the bill that's proposed by the Senate would um, require that in order to go to a 50 50 dividend, we would need $1.3 billion in recurring annual income and 3.5 billion minimum in our constitutional budget reserve. So we've set a bar. We could go to a higher dividend, but we've got to have these fiscal elements in place that create the stability that Representative Shroggy was just talking about. The reason that we're having that debate in our, co our coalition is because people really are concerned about reducing the size of the dividend, acknowledging that many families rely on this. You know, families with lower income rely on having the larger dividends. At the same time, my argument is those same families rely on effective schools for their kids. They want a safe place for their kids to get to school and to be at school. We can assure that with adequate funding for public safety, with adequate teaching staff, with smaller class sizes. Uh, we, can, we can get food stamps out in a timely manner if we could upgrade that, that data system uh, when we should do it, um, which is right now. So, so Drew, that's really what the Senate is looking at in terms of a fiscal plan We've got some revenue measures on the table and some plans uh, for the future. We're just still in a little bit of an arm wrestle with each other. And the House has not indicated, the House majority has not indicated any interest in these items. So thank you for that uh, update on those revenue measures, Senator Giesel. Um, you know, the Senate is only half the legislature and is really not capable of doing anything at all on its own. So Representative Shragi, um, you know, both the revenue measures and in terms of the sort of, uh, I don't remember what the bill number was, but the one that sets the terms on when the PFD would go back to a 50-50 amount. Um, what does the attitude seem to be in the House around those? And does it seem like that could be part of a path forward uh, towards a sort of grand fiscal solution? Yeah, that's a tough question to answer uh, because frankly, the House majority has not provided a lot of indication as to how they would like to move forward through a fiscal plan. Uh, you know, we have heard uh, 
really what we have heard from the House majority is a focus on a spending cap in the Constitution and um, economic growth and government efficiency. And I'm not exactly sure what those are or the dollar amounts associated with them or how they get us to a balanced budget. But that is much of what I've heard is this focus on the spending cap. And I should note resolving the dividend as well uh, with many of the proposals around that paying the dividend as a first draw uh, before all other state services from public safety to education and on down the list. Um, and that is, I think, a large part of the challenge that we face is we have not seen a lot of consensus in the House on what to do about that. Um, you know, I would note, uh, just going back to the budget discussion for a moment, you know, the, the, the things we can balance. We talked about revenue. We talked about uh, how, what can we do for new revenue? What can we do on the dividend? As far as state services go and, and efficiencies or cuts to state services, I would note that this year is the first year, and it's somewhat historic in my view, at least in my time in the legislature, we have not seen major cuts proposed to the budget. In fact, the, the budget produced by the governor was a flat budget, essentially the exact same budget that we passed last year. That budget then went through the Republican-controlled House majority and there were zero cuts offered to that budget outside of, you know, a thousand dollar reduction to some university designated general fund receipts. I mean, the, the cuts that were offered were like half a percentage point, not even that. And so I think that has really set the cuts aside. And now it's really we're, we're left with tough options. Do you reduce the dividend or you generate revenue? And I, I think that is a very difficult we're we're between a rock and a hard place. That is a difficult choice to make. And frankly, I, I am so encouraged to see the good work that the Senate is doing. They're tackling these issues with courage. Again, in the House, we are seeing these bills just discussed and discussed and discussed in a single committee, and we're not really seeing them move forward. We're not seeing a, a message coming from either from, from the House majority, from a majority of legislators on how to move this issue forward. We're seeing, again, spending cap discussions. We're seeing uh, a bill come out of Ways and Means that would reduce the corporate income tax rate while simultaneously putting forward a sales tax with no exemptions. Um, you know, some interesting ideas, not a fiscal plan in and of themselves. And that's where, you know, again, I, I look at the amount of time that we have left in the session, and I'm concerned. Uh, if we don't move these bills forward, uh, if and frankly, yeah, if we don't move these bills forward, we will not be able to get to a place where we can actually form consensus and take action on these these fiscal plan components, these new revenue components. And if I'm being honest and, and with care and respect towards the Senate, I don't know that the Senate wants to take those votes if those bills are then going to come to the House and the House just snubs their nose at them and doesn't take action. Um, you know, I I really feel that for us to find a path forward on this fiscal plan, we, we've got to get leadership of both bodies together with the governor and to find some consensus. And, you know, again, I just, I haven't seen that willingness to, to really engage in that discussion. And, and I'm not really sure what the reason for that is other than folks don't wanna make that very difficult choice between, again, new revenue or reducing the dividend, which frankly, as I see it, are really the only two major options available to us. Uh, there are some great revenue proposals that, that Senator Giesel has talked about. Our caucus would support many of those. Frankly, I think the governor would support many of those, but in the House, we are not in the driver's seat. And that's where, again, we're, we're really calling on folks to think serious, seriously about this, honestly about this, um, to, to accept the fiscal reality that we face and put forward a, a, a a proposal, a fiscal plan framework that will last into future years. You know, I, I, I when I think of what could happen if we do not take action on this, if we don't take action on SB 107 and reduce that dividend amount with that step up? We, we quite literally run the, the, the prospect of running out of money as a state. Um, we, we've gone from a CBR that had $15 billion at its height just a few years ago to now having just above $2 billion left. We've heard from the administration uh, and from our own legislative finance folks that if you have a major downturn in oil revenue or a major financial market crash, 
you, you need at least three and a half billion dollars to be able to fill the hole just for that one year, that short term bridge to keep services running, keep the lights on, keep the police officers showing up at your door when you're being assailed or attacked. So how, how do we do this? When do we take action? Do we just keep kicking the can down the road? Do we keep drawing from savings? I don't think we can. Um, you know, I, I have a chart here that shows oil prices over just the last year, and, and we've got oil prices that range from less than $40 a barrel to more than $110. Um, do I really want to bet the continuity of state services, the, the provision of state services on the fact that we're going to have 80, 90, 100 dollar a barrel oil. I don't know that we will. I don't have confidence in that. We see all this talk of of an economic downturn, of of you know potentially a recession. Um, we've already seen, if you've watched the presentations from the Permanent Fund Corporation on the return on the Permanent Fund, it has not been a good year in the investment markets and the financial markets. So what do we do? What do we do in that situation? Do we do we make those tough, tough, courageous decisions to tackle the big issue of the dividend and revenue? Or, or do we just continue to kind of float along, tell our educators to scrape by, tell our students maybe later? Um, I don't think so. Nor do I think, given the history of where we're at as a state, do we focus on a spending cap first? You know, I have a lot more worry today on how, we're, again, we're going to pay our bills, keep the lights on, keep the heat on, keep the public safety showing up, than I do about future legislators spending too much when oil prices get back up to $100 a barrel if they ever do for a prolonged period. Um, so I, I think we, we have to have um, a, a more nuanced conversation about the future of our state. We need to be more honest about where we are with savings, where we are with our dependency on oil um, to, to really move this forward. And I'm not sure that we're there yet. But I, I would note that, again, the Senate has really shown a lot of courage and leadership in putting forward proposals that deal directly with the dividend formula, that deal directly with new revenues, and do so in a way that ties together and actually works and balances and paints a picture for the future of our state. I'm still waiting for that in the House. Again, optimistic. We do have some time left, but uh, certainly concerned. Thanks, Calvin. I kind of can't believe it took this long into the conversation for a spending cap to come up. It seems like uh, just yesterday that was one of the preeminent sort of uh, legs of the stool of what a, a plan would look like. And uh, it's true that through I've not been paying following as closely as I was when I was down there uh, working in Juneau, but uh, it doesn't seem to have been nearly as part as much uh, a feature of the conversation um, this you know the last year or two. So a couple of really discreet questions um, for you guys, and uh, whichever one of you wants to jump in and take them. Uh, Senator Giesel, I guess, it, I'm just after I say whichever one of you wants to take them. Um, the $4 million threshold on the proposed change for corporate income taxes, is that a $4 million net uh, revenue uh, or, or net profit or gross revenue? That is... An interesting question, which I cannot answer. Fair enough. Um, Sorry, I don't have the bill in front of me or I would check it out. Yeah, I appreciate the question for, from the audience member who asked it. And I will uh, I can go find that out and send them a, a note on it. Um, the other one is, that? where do we stand on our old uh, defined benefit? Um, you know, tiers one, two and three, uh, that pension system. Are we uh, sort of fully forward funded where we expect the the money that we've got there and the revenue that those investments make to cover all of the obligations of those plans into the future? Or are we still you know, expecting to have to add some general fund uh, money to meet those obligations in the future? Great question. So we still have past service costs. That's called an unfunded liability, but the technical name is uh, past service costs. So those are continuing to be paid down by both employer and employee contributions, uh, mainly employer, right? Part of that 22% that they kick in. Uh, if that's not enough, of course, the state covers any gap there that is above the 22%. We will continue to be paying, delegating uh, contributions from employers with, to those past service costs, even with the new defined benefit plan. So uh, it's carefully 
uh, structured so that some of it will go into a sub trust for the medica medical treatment, medical care, uh, the um, health uh, savings arrangement, health reimbursement arrangement, the new uh, pension plan itself, and then into past service costs. So we will continue to pay that down. Yeah, and I think that, that what you hit on at the beginning of the response there is an important thing to keep in mind. I think it's easy to think about the fact that we change retirement systems and like that's the old system and it's gone and maybe we're paying retirees out of it. I've got to be one of the youngest uh, tier three employees in the state because when I was 18, I worked for a summer for fish and game. And so I'm 35, but under a defined benefit system myself. So if I went back to working for the state, I would be making contributions into that system. And then whenever I eventually retire, I will still be taking contributions from that system. So we're going to continue to be sort of actively working with the, you know, those prior tiers uh, for, you know, many years to come. Yes. And Drew, if you were to go back to work for the state, you would be placed into, and the bill passed, you would be placed into that new defined benefit pool. The reason for, that we require that is that we need that pool to be large. We need it to be substantial for the costs to be covered for it. So that's one of the provisions of the new, uh, the new bill that's being offered. Oh, well, I learned a new thing today and it's really directly about me. So uh, that's yeah. always fun. Um, so we've got another question here, you know, talking about the tax bills that are before us, um, I don't know that I heard an income tax talked about much. Um, is there any realistic chance that an income tax uh, serves as that revenue measure? Well, that's a great okay. question. Oh, go ahead. On, on the Senate side, there aren't the votes for an income tax, though I will tell you that um, that I think a lot of people are considering it more, more seriously now. Um, the governor's, governor offered that 2% sales tax. The Senate regards sales taxes as the purview of local governments. We have many communities that have their own sales tax and for the state to pile on on top of that, uh, we, we just don't think that's appropriate. In addition to the fact that the governor is proposing no exemptions in his 2% tax. Yeah, and I'll just quickly jump in uh, on that one, Drew. I, I think, uh, you know, with res respect to discussions around an income tax, I will tell you that from what I've heard in the House there, uh, well, one, we have a member of our caucus who has proposed an income tax. Uh, Representative Galvin of Anchorage has proposed a progressive income tax, a high earner's income tax. Uh, and so, uh, one, I just commend her for putting forward a proposal. It's hard to vote on an income tax, let alone to put one forward. But again, when you talk about the structural issues we face as a state, those are the sorts of big, broad ideas that we're going to have to face. The reality is we are the only state that does not have a sales or an income tax. And there are both merits and downsides to both, admitting but I would note that when you look at a sales tax, as Senator Giesel noted, it is the purview of local governments. But in addition to that, I think there's a tremendous amount of concern over two issues. One is the disproportional impact on rural Alaskans, where the price of a gallon of milk or laundry detergent or anything else is just exorbitant. It is unfathomable for many of us in urban Alaska. And to tack a sales tax on top of that is just it's hard to imagine how folks would 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 get by and be able to to meet their household budgets. That's a tremendous concern for me. It's a tremendous con concern for rural legislators. And for that reason, I think it would be incredibly difficult to get the votes necessary to pass a sales tax out of the House. On the income tax front, or so the second concern with the sales tax is that it doesn't hit out-of-state workers who come up and benefit from our state. We talk a lot about local residents having buy-in on state services, but I consistently come back to the question of shouldn't all those who benefit from our state contribute to state services, contribute to roads, to permitting, to licensing, to all the things that we do as a state? 
We have a large number of commercial fishermen that live out of state and come here mm -hmm. to benefit off our oceans and streams. We have a large number of oil workers and contractors who go to the North Slope or others, uh, other areas of our state to profit off of our resources. And the reality is, is that while some of them would make purchases locally for toothpaste and food and whatever else, many of them, many of them essentially go straight to work and straight back out of state. And they take all that money with them to spend in their local communities. They quite literally profit off our resources, which are taken out of the ground or out of our oceans. And they take all much of the benefit of that back home. And we don't see a dime of that other than, you know, the market activity, the commerce that we see, there is benefit to that, of course. But I think that they should have some of that benefit taxed and contributed back to the state. And that's one of the reasons that I support an income tax. Now, my preference would be something that's flat and broad and uh, isn't exorbitant. I think it's one, just more palatable to folks. And I think the other thing that uh, I would note when talking about an income tax is, you know, I consistently hear at the doors, if folks aren't supportive of an income tax, one of the main reasons is you're going to be taxing my retirement income. You're going to be taxing those of low wages. I don't know of an income tax out there that doesn't exempt retirement income or that doesn't exempt those below the poverty levels or 200% of poverty. We can structure that in a way that's responsible and still has, again, not only residents, but folks that are coming up here to benefit from our state paying into that. Um, and then, of course, they contribute to the state. And then if they're spending time in local communities, oftentimes being hit with a sales tax, which contributes to that local community. And so we end up having this diversified tax base, which provides some of that stability that we've continued to talk about over and over and over again tonight, that need for stability so that we can prosper, so our students can prosper, so that our businesses can prosper, and that we can attract outside investment into our state. Um, so, you know, again, whatever we end up coming to, whether it's income tax, sales tax, the biggest thing for me is that we have something that's broad, that's fair, and that meets the need. Um, you know, I, at the end of the day, I'm going to support whatever we can get 21 votes for on the floor and 11 in the Senate, because we've got to take action on this. And I, you know, I could get to a place where I'd support a sales tax. Um, I could also support an income tax. Um, I, I want to see services paid for. So Drew, I'll take on to the great talking points that, that Representative Froggy just shared. Um, I've never been a fan of an income tax, but I'm gonna tell you I'm moving uh, my opinion. And Representative Froggy identified the oil field workers, the fisheries, right? The fishing uh, employees, but there's another set. We've got a lot of infrastructure money coming from the federal government and we don't have a workforce to provide the, the workforce for all that money. We're going to be bringing people up for that. We need to be collecting some taxes on them. But there's another group that I'm seeing more and more interest in, and that is bringing up outside healthcare workers through this thing called Compax, which would, it's basically a national uh, healthcare license. I'm going to refer to the nursing license. Uh, it would be uh, a compact license that maybe someone in Idaho gets. And they can travel to all the compact states and work without getting a license in those particular states. We would be throwing the doors open to bringing up nurses from out of state travelers. Uh, there's a bill to include physical therapists, occupational therapists. We're, these are high paying jobs and we're inviting outside folks to come up and take these jobs and they're leaving, not leaving anything behind in terms of um, paying for services that we offer. So I am considering more and more uh, the value of, as Senator or Representative Shroggy said, a broad, low income tax with the proper exemptions. But we'll see where we get. Um, I am, we, we do talk about that in the Senate caucus meetings, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. And I will just add, because I think Representative Grow would probably uh, want to hit me over the head if I didn't mention it, the dentists uh, that he fired. You know, we also have folks that come up here to provide dentistry and other professional services, legal services that come up here for the summer, profit greatly, and then go back home. And just another group that isn't contributing on a fair and, and equitable way uh, or equitable level to our state services. So, um, 
just had to throw that in there for Representative Groh's sake. I am certain I am not the only person on this call who has heard Rep. Groh's anecdotes about the divorce proceedings and the court documents coming out and showing just how much more a doctor could make in Alaska uh, than where they were living down in the States. Um, okay, so we've got about five minutes left. Uh, one more sort of constructive question before I've got a final wrap-up question after this. Um, I think a lot of us, you know, were really interested in the fiscal policy working group and that they came out with something that kind of looked like a roadmap to what role is that sort of planning document that that group generated playing in the discussions that are going on in Juno today? Well, well, maybe I'll take um, the first stab at that just because I did serve on the fiscal plan working group uh, and, and played a, a fairly substantial role in that. You know, I, I think that it, uh, well, I, I know that it continues to be discussed. Uh, the fiscal plan working group um, provided a roadmap to how we could structure a fiscal plan in the state of Alaska. Uh, now, I had a legislator recently come up to me and say, well, we have the model. Let's just pass that. Uh, and I said, well, I would love to. Uh, however, in this legislature, it is a new legislature with new legislators and a changed political landscape. And where we may have had support for constitutional provisions, as was outlined in the fiscal plan working group roadmap, I'm not sure that there is support for constitutional measures, not only because there's a lot of concern about what those constitutional measures or amendments could look like when they finally leave the legislature, uh, but also because it has a very high thresh vote threshold associated with those provisions. So, you know, if it were a situation in which we could take the entire roadmap and just place it before the legislature and the support was there for those components, I'd say let's do that. I think the concern is that there are a lot of new legislators that are uncomfortable with some of those provisions. And, you know, maybe that I'll, I'll just add on that the, the, the thing that I think the fiscal plan working group was most beneficial um, in or the way in which it was beneficial, at least for me, is showing how you get to an end product that the legislature can agree on, not necessarily the specific end product itself. We had a lot of of just talk when the fiscal plan working group was being created that you'll never get there. You'll never find consensus. You have quite literally one of the most progressive senators in the state of Alaska and one of the most conservative representatives in the state of Alaska on a working group together with ranges from 800 million in cuts being proposed to a billion dollars in new revenue. They said, you'll never do it. We were able to get to an end product though that we were able to unanimously agree on. And the way that we were able to do that was one, through conversation and respect of course, but two, and most importantly, having a common understanding of the, the, the inputs into the system. What do we assume for the growth of government over the next decade? Are we going to be able to reduce government spending? Are we going to grow with inflation? Are we gonna grow with more than inflation? What is our capital budget? What is a reasonable, plug for our capital budget over the next decade? Is it zero? Is it 50 million? Is it 200 million? Is it 400 million? What is a reasonable assumption for the market return for the permanent fund? What is a reasonable assumption for the price of a barrel of oil? And why am I saying that these inputs are so important? It's because if you don't define the inputs, if you don't define some of these core assumptions and come to some consensus on that first, the target will continue to move. And when you start talking about, well, do we pass 400 million in new revenue or a billion three in new revenue? The price of oil is going to have a huge impact on that. And the target will shift and move and you will never get to agreement because the moment someone doesn't like that end product, they'll change an input and the whole structure comes falling down. And that's where, for me, I think one of the things we really have to do is be clear eyed about operating budget, just again, uh, uh, what is that growth rate over the next 10 years, capital budget over the next 10 years, oil revenue and permanent fund revenue over the next 10 years. And if you can't get those things, if you can't get some shared understanding on those, I don't think you'll get anywhere else. So that's the part that I think that's that's the first step really for us if we're going to actually get somewhere. It's something I've talked a little bit about, but I think we've got a lot more work to do um, to, to really be able to take action on this. No, from a third party's perspective, uh, you know, not in Juno listening, that has really felt like a different thing this year. And I think that, you know, things like the governor coming out and talking about interest in a sales tax and stuff like that, those are indicative of uh, 
we're coming a lot closer than we were four or five years ago in terms of what decision is it that we're making? Um, because people would set the, the, the question up to make the answer that they like the right one. Um, and if you can keep changing the question, then, you know, everybody's going to say, look, it's so obviously is my answer. And here's all the reasons I love my answer. And then that doesn't produce a, a result. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Senator Giesel, before I ask the last question? Well, you know, um, you know, Drew, part of the reason that that conversation has changed, you just observed that, is the voters sent a whole group of new people to the legislature this year. And I think the governor's, I'm going to call it new view, uh, where he offers a, a sales tax and he starts talking about wanting to see some stability. And he, is, he has told us he's open to a discussion about what the dividend is. The reason for that evolution in his views, I believe is partially attributable to the new folks that, that the voters have sent to the legislature. I think the governor has seen that the approach he was taking before is not supported by governors or by uh, voters. Yes, he was reelected, but when they chose their own representatives, the voters chose people that were much more moderate and collaborative. And, and I think that is what has changed the conversation. Certainly in the Senate, that's what brought a 17 member bipartisan coalition together. And I'll tell you that uh, every, co every uh, coalition meeting, every caucus meeting that we have, Senator Stevens either begins or ends the meeting with, we wanna keep this group together. Let's continue to work together to talk about how we solve these issues. So, so I think that's really what's made the difference. Uh, it's, it's really refreshing for me. Uh, having been there during those very divided times, having two years off as a vacation, so to speak, uh, but glad to be back and working with such a wonderful group of folks like Representative Shoggy. Okay, well, if you guys are both game, I've got one more question for you. We're already at 7.03. Um, so what advice would the two of you have for your average Alaskan who isn't in the legislature, who maybe isn't so connected, on how can you, you know, both in the near immediate term, like for this session and more long term, how can you, you know, help contribute to the state making a decision and moving forward with a new sort of fiscal plan? You know what I tell folks? Um, I, first off, I put out a weekly newsletter um, that has a lot of this information in it every week. And I get responses from people and I tell them, look, if you agree that the 2575 split is what we need, send that message to more people, not just me, but send it out. You can get the legislators email addresses or call them. Um, but really people need to hear from citizens and not uh, ranting, uh, screaming, um, disrespectful, but, but those rational uh, conversations. People listening to this right now are engaged and obviously care about Alaska's future. I welcome that input. Uh, so that's what I tell people, let your voice be heard, come to community meetings, come to town halls that various legislators hold around the state and, and make yourself known. Yeah, I would, uh pretty much mirror Senator Giesel's remarks. I think uh, folks are oftentimes surprised to hear that I probably get less than 20 to 30 emails, one-to-one -one from constituents in a year, less than 30 from constituents. You can have a huge impact by just, and and I think Giesel's, Senator Giesel's looking at me like, really, only 30? But, you know, I probably get more than 30, but it's from 30 people, you know? There's not that many folks in the community that are getting engaged in the process. You know, I might get 10 or 12 emails from someone that's very engaged, very involved, has a lot of thoughts on the budget process, follows things very closely. But, you know, the number of emails that I, I get from, from just folks that aren't necessarily tuned in every day to the, the House finance meetings or Senate finance meetings, it's not a huge number. And I think, 
I think legislators really appreciate getting those one-to-one -one emails from constituents to just say, hey, here's what I heard about the dividend, or here's what I heard about tax proposals, and I just wanted to offer my thoughts as a constituent. I think that's incredibly helpful. And then, you know, more of the long game is having those conversations. We started started this Alaska Common Ground meeting off tonight with, you know, we're going to be talking to Alaskans. Talk to your fellow neighbors. When you're you're at soccer practice or you're at the grocery store talking to your friends in the neighborhood and education comes up or the challenges with the schools, talk about how that is a symptom of not having a stable budget in the state of Alaska, about not having a stable revenue source. Make that connection for people. You know, you don't have to get into the weeds. You don't have to get into, you know, left versus right politics, but just have a conversation about funding education. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people can can understand and latch on to. And it, it just has there's a lot of value there in just helping people to better understand these issues and shift that public dialogue to shift it to more about how are we going to invest in our state again to strengthen the private sector, to strengthen the public sector so that we prosper as a state. Have those conversations with folks because you know it life is busy. You know, we're all, I think, uh, political super fans to be on this call tonight, or we care a lot, at least about our state, if we're not political super fans. Go talk to your neighbors. I guarantee nine out of 10 of them have never watched a, a gavel to gavel session, and they've never, they, they've never attended one of these events. And so that brief surface level conversation that just helps people frame a little bit of understanding about how our state functions, how we pay for state services can go a really long ways, um, a surprisingly long ways. And so I just would encourage people to talk to your neighbors, talk to Alaskans, have those conversations so that we can start to shift our state in a more positive direction that's less focused on just what's the amount of the dividend this year. And um, I, I think that goes a long ways. You know, Drew, um... I just want to comment, uh, Representative Shroggy brought up being a fan. I want to tell you that I belong to a fan club, the Representative Calvin Shroggy fan club. Um, you know, one of the things I think about as a territorial kid is who the next generation of leaders will be. And Representative Shroggy has the intellectual skills. He is a leader. He has the work ethic and he cares about Alaska. And I'll tell you, um, someday I'll be retiring not that far off from now, and I feel very comfortable knowing that folks like Representative Shroggy will be taking the reins, and uh, he just does a great job. So thanks for having him on with me. What a great, uh, I, I really enjoy working with him as well. Well, I, well, it was now I got fun shower and compliments funny. On, and no, no, Drew, I've got to shower compliments on Senator Giesel now. No, I, I will just say you're, you're too kind, Senator, and uh, I, I so appreciate all the work that you do for our state. Um, it's only because of folks like yourself that have really stood up for our state that allows me to be here today. I'm a product of our local public education system. I'm a product of UAA. I would not be where I am if it weren't for all of the investments that prior generations made in my state to help then me to bring up a better state hopefully for my newborn child. Um, we, we're all in this together. It takes all of us to make these big changes. Thank you guys. Uh, just an absolute dream to, you know, moderator, facilitator, whatever I was doing. Um, thank you for taking the time, making this stuff approachable, um, bringing your expertise. I know this is the difficult time to get engaged. So I hope that everybody in the audience listens to your advice and, you know, uh, responds in kind with taking some time to uh, reach out to their neighbors and reach out to their representatives and senators um, and make their voices heard. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll bow off. Thank you guys, and I'll leave it to Chuck to uh, wrap up on behalf of Alaska Common Ground. Okay, we'll wrap it up. But thank you so much, Senator and Representative. That's been an incredibly great discussion. Um, thank you for all your hard work. You're obviously making great progress, and we look forward to to a, to a great conclusion to all this good work. So thank, thanks so much. I know it's a busy time, and, and we do really appreciate the excellent presentations and discussion. And thank you to Drew for being a great moderator. He always does a great job. And uh, Kari Gaudi, Gardi, who has put together the Zoom session behind the scenes, she makes it all work both for the Zoom session and uh, Common Ground in general. She does a great job making things happen for Common Ground. So like with all Zoom sessions, we don't get applause, but uh, I'm sure people are probably clapping their hands right now for, for the good presentations and the good discussions. So thanks very much. 
Um, and a special thanks to all those who took part, took some time tonight to listen up. You know, these are engaged citizens who want to find out more, who want to, to make Alaska a better place. So thank you for tuning in and, uh, you know, we'll do another one. In fact, we have one coming up on May 22nd, a panel about fiscal, fiscal issues on May 22nd. So um, if you're not a Common Ground member, you might think about becoming a member or donate to Common Ground so we can continue to put on these kind of discussions and, and educational um, programs to help Alaska deal with fiscal policy issues and other any a number of issues that Alaska has. So, um, and you can do that by going to alaskacommonground.org or dot, yeah, alaskacommonground.org um, to become a member or to make a donation. We certainly appreciate it. So with that, we'll close out the session and I'll just say, stay healthy, stay engaged and uh, good evening and thank you very much. <laughs>